Humanity's childhood ends one day when the planet is visited by those responsible for implementing the plans of the universal supermind. People's life seems like a fairy tale at first, with the aliens solving global problems in a short period of time. No more wars, hunger and poverty. However, having received everything they could dream of, mankind does not even think about the price of such charity, and in the end, the payback time comes. There is one man left on Earth, Milo Rodericks, who sits on a couch in the middle of a ruined city. And then there are shots of trash, smoking pipes, melting glaciers and people dying of hunger and disease. New York City 2016. A kid in a wheelchair, Milo, draws spaceships. At this time, a small plane flies over Ricky Stormgren's farm, before suddenly hovering in the air and slowly sinking into the corn. All the people on Earth lose communication. Right in the middle of the city, the airliner gently lowers and lands. And over the main cities of the world, a huge flying ship hovering over the people, scaring them. TV goes on, reports of all the troops of the world being put on alert, causing panic, and the media mogul Wayne Wright suggests a takeover of the planet. But no one tries to make contact with the humans on Earth. Suddenly, a deceased loved one appears to each person and, introducing himself by the Karelan name, announces that the purpose of his arrival is to help humanity. They have come a long way to make people forget about wars, famine and inequality. And the process of humanity's golden age has already begun. Listening to this address, Wainwright gives the newcomers a name, Overlords. A wave of change and wars ending rolls around the world. One day, Ricky is visited by his girlfriend, Ellie. She has seen her dead father, but the man withholds that he saw his dead wife, Annabelle. There are reports going to the government to stop the wars in the Congo, Sudan and Korea. And where the warnings are not understood, a solar eclipse occurs, after which the inhabitants all join together in round, dancing and singing hymns. Looking at this, Wainwright remembers his father, who was very concerned about the peace of his pigs, so they went to the slaughterhouse happy. Meanwhile, Ricky comes to a community meeting and reassures the public, if this is an invasion, it's going well for the people of the Earth. In the evening, all the electrical appliances in their house suddenly turn on. The house begins to shake and then it literally goes to pieces, with bright lights blaring in the yard. Ricky goes out into the yard, sees the flying module and asks that his house be left alone. The structure immediately comes together and the door opens in the module, inviting the man in. At this time, the military cordons off the area over which the spaceship is hovering. But many sick and crippled people try to make their way to it. Ricky finds himself in the honeymoon suite of the Four Seasons Hotel, where he and Anna Bell spend their first days after the wedding. Carol Ann Voice explains, people were on the threshold of discovering interstellar travel, but the stars aren't for humans. The aliens need a liaison between overlords and the Earth, and Ricky is the best match. Carol Ann can't show his face yet, because humans aren't ready for it, and then he gives Ricky a gift. Intelligence officer Paul Danlow learns of Ricky's kidnapping and goes to his farm, where journalists arrive. Ellie recounts what happened when the capsule lands in the yard and everyone sees Ricky alive. People underneath the ship try to break through the military formation. One woman silently holds out a crying baby to the sky. Denlo asks Ricky to give back the object he received from the alien, but in Paul's hands it goes off. The baby in the woman's arms stops crying, and terrible red spots come off his face. Sick people everywhere are recovered, and the first happened when the bottle was opened. Ricky gives a press conference where he relays Carol Ann words that the environment and social policy will be changed. Answering a question, what does the alien ship look like from the inside, Ricky makes a joke, like a Four Seasons hotel room. Ellie hears this, and when the man comes home, she says she understands. Annabelle came to see him, but she's always there for him. Meanwhile, Wainwright concludes that this is an invasion. The alien again refuses to show himself. The people will not accept him, although they have already begun to feel each other's pain. And to make it reach faster, the overlords have sealed off oil wells in Saudi Arabia. Nevertheless, Wainwright is preparing a Freedom League petition, calling for the expulsion of the aliens. Ricky reminds us of the world's peace that has come to Earth. Thousands of warships have been free that can be loaded with food and sent to those in need. The Arabs are offered to fill the empty oil pipes with water and transfer them to Africa. But the Mughals refuse. Then Ricky asks to let everyone get a drink. And the glasses are poured with oil. The Arabs have to accept the offer. Six months passed. There are shots of Hitler's military parades. 
The voice says that when they first arrived, everyone was frightened, but they brought order and stability. The sponsor is the Freedom League. Milo's mother is proud of his son. He wrote an essay about overlords and got a scholarship for it. Freedom League is getting stronger, though Carol Lynn hoped that there would be no more angry crowds in the world, and again refuses to show up for Ricky. Somehow, Milo finds a mother buying substances from her dealer and sees him beating a woman. Milo steps in and the man shoots him. The woman screams and hugs her son's body. Suddenly, a beam of light falls from the sky and the criminal falls. The light shifts to Milo and the boy comes back to life and gets back on his feet. Wainwright talks about it on TV. The dealer, of course, is a scoundrel, but he was destroyed without a trial. The girl Greta, whose believing mother committed suicide because the concept of God is destroyed, joins the conversation. Freedom League fighters capture Ricky and Ellie turns to heaven for help. The man is brought to Wayne Wright, who offers to join him in the struggle. This whole conversation is broadcast all over the world, unbeknownst to the tycoon. And he says, let the world be destroyed by man, then thrive under the alien domination. Ricky refuses and Wainwright orders the shooting. Suddenly time stands still. A door opens before Ricky, behind which Anna Bell awaits him. The man leaves and finds himself not far from his home. In the morning, Ellie puts a camera in Ricky's pocket. He must see the real Carol Ann. And he confesses that he wanted the world to see the real face of the League, which is ready even to kill for the sake of profit. Now the resistance has been dissolved and a worldwide confederation has been created, uniting the states. The alien refuses to show his face again because he has seen people's reactions to their appearance. So Ricky brings his camera up to the glass and takes a picture. At home he shows it to Ellie. Carol Ann was right, you shouldn't show this to people. And he proposes to the woman. Greta urges the churchgoers not to give up and have faith. The news says that Wainwright hanged himself in his office. Somehow Milo visits his elderly friend, Kenny. The boy is upset, science is dying, and he does not want that because he intends to fly to an alien planet. Fifteen years have passed. Milo got his degree and got a job as an astrophysicist. Mom stopped drinking and got younger. It happened to everyone though. Earth was reborn and is now waiting to meet her guardian angels. Kenny, instead of the old car, moved into a roadhouse. However, he can live anywhere. People, realizing they no longer had to earn money, settled wherever they wanted, leaving their apartments with the doors open. The aliens succeeded in creating a paradise on Earth. One day, Jake Gregson is greeted at home by his son and rushes in. It's on. The family sits down in front of the television. The big day has arrived. Today, Carol Lynn will show himself. 200,000 spectators wait in front of the pillar on which the spaceship will descend. Greta is also watching TV. The ship goes down. It is greeted by children by the request of Carol Ann. Under the amazed cries of the Earthlings, the devil comes out of it. 2,035 years had come and the Golden Age had really arrived for mankind. Inequality, crime and war are gone. People have renewable, environmentally friendly energy and enough food for the entire planet. People are aging slower and there's almost no sickness. The birth rate is rising. For those who still want to hold on to the old, there is New Athens, where overlords have allowed things to be left as they were. Milo works at the Rupert Boyce Institute in South Africa, but even there, scientific research is going nowhere. So Milo's program is being shut down. His co-worker Rachel regrets it. He has spent his life studying the overlords, where they came from, what their language is, but people never learned anything. Greta, who has grown up, also thinks about the devil all the time. One day, Carol Ann comes to Ricky and he complains about how he feels. He has begun to get tired and they can't make a baby. But the alien has come to announce Earth's new destiny. Meanwhile, a new room with a spirit board has inexplicably appeared in the boys' center. It is a communication device, but with whom? Jake takes his son to see a psychologist, Greta Jones. The boy doesn't sleep well and his wife talks in her sleep about saving the children. Somehow, Boy shows Milo a room full of animal figures, which he captures and sends to the planet overlords, and confesses that he intends to persuade the aliens to take him with them. Tommy admits to Greta that he travels at night to a dark and hot place where there is fire and smoke everywhere, and a huge eye reigns over everything. Suddenly, Tom grabs his head and starts screaming, and Greta feels a gasp. Her cross changes shape and comes off her neck. There is silence, and Tom tells his mother that everything is alright, the baby is no longer crying, 
The woman is stunned, but she's not pregnant. Meanwhile, Ricky is given a terrible diagnosis. This is what Carol Ann was talking about. He has been poisoned by some substance present in the shell of the ship. Greta goes to the pastor, tells him about Tom and shows him her cross. And Milo says that the aliens look like demons because they have been to Earth before and people have seen them. Greta shows an illustration of hell. Tom describes the location of the visit as just that. It turns out that the overlords are hell breathers, destroying humanity's last stronghold, Faith. Four months later, the Gregsons learn that they are having a daughter. Amy comes up with a name for the baby girl, while Tom tells her father his sister's name, Jennifer. The man hears confirmation from his wife, but she just picked that name, and Tom couldn't possibly have known it. In the evening, Jake suggests that his wife fly to New Athens and remember the good things of her past life. Dr. Boyce requires Gregson's family to be brought in. At this time, Greta sees a report about Ricky's illness and goes to his farm. Jake receives a personal invitation from Boyce to negotiate the construction of a golf course. At the reception, Boyce meets the Gregson's family. Jake meets Milo and he informs him that the center is closing. Then why was the planner actually invited? He tells his wife and goes looking for his son. At this point, Carol Ann reminds him that all the people have lost the need for research, they have something to be proud of. Later, the alien invites Amy into a room with a chalkboard and there asks her to put her hand on the disc. That way, he can talk to the one inside her. He urges the child to open up to him. A strong beam of light bursts out of the building and hits the sky. Tom refuses to go with his father and runs away. Jake sees his son climb the high platform and jump down. Amy faints. Carol Ann is pleased. She has accepted and understood. Now it's time to move on. Tom hovers half a meter from Earth and marvels at Jennifer's strength. Looking at the light pillars, Milo realizes that this is the alphabet, where each letter is associated with a particular constellation, which means he has found the home of the overlords. Rachel kisses him. The alien brings Ricky his medicine. Then he apologizes to Ellie, but Greta enters and accuses the alien of lying. Carol Ann confesses they are barren because of him. Ellie grabs the gun, but Ricky convinces her to put the barrel down. The Guardian says that the day is coming when those who have children will be very badly off. Greta shoots the alien. He falls, and Ricky injects him with a drug obtained for himself. Carol Ann regains consciousness. Returning home, Greta looks at a photograph of her mother and suddenly hears her voice. Turning around, she sees a woman and goes out the window. Amy gives birth to a baby girl. Four years have passed. Jennifer is playing in her room. Milo reflects on the new age children who eat healthy foods and are stress-free. People are evolving, but into what? One day, a boy who moves objects easily is brought to him for an appointment. Ricky is getting worse, even the alien drugs don't help. Carol Ann informs him that the last stage has begun. He's the father of 24 children, so he understands the horror waiting for people. One day, Rachel sees a girl with her arm out stretched upward and calling out for Jennifer. And this is happening all over the world. And Jason notices children standing outside his house. Milo shares with Rachel the discovery that all the children are connected to Jennifer. Tom reveals that his little sister takes him to different worlds, even to places the overlords have never been to. Jake tries to kick the children out of his yard, but is stopped by the sheer number of them. After packing up their belongings, the Gregson's family leaves. The children block their way, but Jennifer orders them to disperse. But in New Athens, all the children they meet keep their eyes on Jennifer. The Gregsons are greeted by Mayor Jerry Holcross and shown around the city. There is culture here, they even make movies. Jennifer suddenly says a cryptic phrase about red numbers that will end everything. Jerry brings a family to his workshop, he had been a painter before he came. And he talks about his dead daughter, who has been treated with earthly medicines. Meanwhile, Ellie makes a collage of photos from before the advent. She and Ricky had a pretty good life. Amy lets Milo talk to Jennifer. He is convinced. The girl is the conduit of power to which everything in the world is drawn and asks to look in the mirror. She shows him a picture of a fiery mountain and the mirror shatters. Milo is convinced he needs to go to the Overlord's planet to prevent Earth's destruction and asks Rachel to send him along with the animals. She asks Milo not to leave, but he has calculated everything. It will take only 100 days to do everything. The girl recalculates. At space speed, that's 80 years. Ricky is getting worse. He's in pain and calls for Annabelle. 
Ellie responds to her name. Rachel and Milo are testing animal carrier bags. The man shows the drugs he takes with him. Adrenaline, steroids and vitamins. She then packs Milo in a squid bag. He asks her if he does not return to go to the orbital station and lie in anabiosis. The ship takes off. That night, Ricky goes out into the yard and falls on the grass. He confesses his love to Ellie and she lies down next to him. They look at the constellations, then Ricky dies. The Gregson's family is watching an old movie, but suddenly Carol Ann appears on the screen and proclaims that a great mind has stole them to watch over humanity's transition to a higher level of consciousness. No more children will be born on Earth. The adults are left to live out their lives in peace, paving the way for a new species. Jennifer takes to the sky, and all the children around the world rush after her. The inconsolable parents cry out in the pain of separation. Amy and Jason ask Tom to stay, while Jerry turns on the bomb. The red numbers start counting down. The Gregsons come to the church too. Tommy says goodbye, he has to go too. There is an explosion. The girl stands on top of the mountain, energy swirls gather around her and take off into the sky. Milo comes to and sees the overlord, he shows him his world. Forty years have passed on Earth. Everything that has happened was long ago planned by a world-changing superintelligence. The pillar of fire is the connection to him. Milo then hears voices, it is a unified consciousness. The children are God, evolving into one mind. A multitude of Rachel appears before Milo. And he comes to his senses, he has to come back. A man wakes up in front of a screen with his Earth on it. 85 years have passed. The space station is dead long ago. He's shown Rachel's frozen body. Milo tears the locket and Rachel is shattered into a thousand pieces. He realizes that he is the last living person on Earth. Carol Lynn confirms that this is the fate of many worlds. They too have reached the highest point of their development. Their children will go where the super rulers have no access. Milo asks to be sent to Earth. So he sits in the middle of a ruined city on an old couch and asks the Guardians not to forget about his planet. Jennifer, standing on the mountain, pulls energy from everywhere. Milo asks to save at least something from Earth's culture. The planet explodes. The overlords fly away, leaving a tune for anyone passing by to hear. This is where the series ends. The series isn't bad itself, however there is still not enough to capture the depth that lies in Arthur Clarke's short format book. Therefore, let's read the written works, because the human imagination repeatedly surpasses the most advanced features of cinema.